like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers for the kind invitation uh, to allow me the opportunity to speak here. So I'm going to do um, one thing right now, which is to pull you down from the system level you have been sort of discussing at the system level and really go through the nitty-gritty at the molecular level of how a particular type of action by this class of peptide referred to as antimicrobial peptide and how the actions can actually be circumvented through evolution. So what are antimicrobial peptides? Another name for it um, is host defense peptide. And basically, this is an evolutionarily conserved component of our innate immune response system. And it is actually found among all living uh, matters. And so the job really is to differentiate what is the whole cell so that it would not uh, hurt it and what is foreign so that it would elicit lytic activities. And it is thought that it can actually do its functions in a variety of different ways, including membrane disruption. So what is drawn here is a cellular membrane, a cartoon thereof, whereby the majority of it is made up of a lipid binder that has a, each lipid has a hydrophilic part and a hydrophobic tail, a self-assembled in this type of structure. The antimicrobial peptide can also interfere the metabolism of these microbes and hence kill it, or it could actually be imported into the microbes and actually target the cytoplasmic component of the system. So unlike antibiotics, which we take when we have a bacterial infection, these class of peptide, and over 1,200 of them has been identified as antimicrobial in nature, actually has a wide range of uh, target, uh, ranging from gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria to viruses, and so on and so forth. And there is the common features that link them together is that they are all short peptide, usually less than 50 um, residue in length. They are mostly charged, and a lot of them are cationic in nature, so positively charged. And they are amphiphilic, so part of it likes to be with water, and part of it do not like to be exposed to water at all. There really isn't any one particular structure that you define this class of peptide. They could be alpha-helical, they could be extended, they could have beta sheet or beta barrel type of structure, but all in all, they're very effective towards a whole class of bacteria. So as I said, that they exist in a lot of living creatures, so uh, meganin may be something that I've heard about that is from the skin of the clawed frog, and in human, we have in our innate immune system, L37 or defensin, uh, cows have their own interlycidin. And today I'm going to focus on one that is actually isolated from pigs, which is called protagrin. So the color coding here in this uh, structure of the peptide has to do with part of it being hydrophobic and part of it being hydrophilic. And the reason why this class of peptide is interesting is because that its targeting motif is mostly on the membrane surface, and it presents itself as a very useful new wave of antibiotics. So speaking of antibiotics, we know that the antibiotic target, conventional one, goes, works by inhibiting a very specific biochemical pathway. The detail is not important, but if I were to imagine that the surface of the microbe has a receptor, and my antibiotic is really looking at a lock and key type of interaction so that it would see that receptor, recognize it, and target it. So it is not that difficult for the microbe to sort of alter or mutate its shape so that it no longer would be recognized by the antibiotics. And that's why, even when we're getting better, we still have to finish our round of antibiotics so that the more virulent uh, speech would not be able to propagate and mutate against the antibiotics. So even though it is much harder to Im be immune against the antimicrobial activities, there are species who actually has been able to develop, and as I said, this antimicrobial peptide is evolutionary uh, maintained in our immune system. There is, as earlier um, in the day, there is this opposite opposing forces that I append. So as the microbe evolves, so do the antimicrobial peptide. And the antimicrobial resistance can be developed by the micro through a variety of strategies. So for example, because of the charged nature of the, of the peptide, 
some of the microbes can actually alter the membrane that's charged surfaces so as to lower the preferential partitioning of the peptide in the surface. Or one can actually limit the number of a membrane target by generating a polysaccharide, so a sugar molecule that is on top, to prevent the surface targeting. There are other strategies like changing the outer membrane protein production so that you might actually create more enzyme to kill the antimicrobial peptide, or you create transport uh, protein to pump it in and then pump it back out. Um, there has been also other work suggest that increasing in the membrane hydrophobicity also give rise to this antimicrobial resistance. So today I'm just going to focus on two particular points. One has to do with the surface charge argument for this partitioning and why microbe would actually change the surface charge to prevent the action of antimicrobial peptide. And the second one has to do with how increasing the membrane hydrophobicity actually plays a role in this defense mechanism of the microbial to the antimicrobial peptide. So the particular one, as I mentioned, is this protein one, which is derived from pig leukocyte. And so in this picture, you see that this is a very short um, peptide, only have 18 amino acid in sequence, but it's very stable in structure because of two intramolecular disulfide bonds. And it has a wide variety of targets, including gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, fungi, and even HIV virus. So there's a lot of attention paid to this and others antimicrobial peptide. And it is thought that the active targeting location is actually the membrane itself. So if I were to subject an E. coli in the absence and then in the presence of the antimicrobial peptide, you see morphologically there is a lot of change on the outer membrane of the E. coli. You see these microvilli, these little arms, started projecting from the surface of the outer membrane as a first wave of instability that has given rise to the membrane of the micro as an encounter of the antimicrobial peptide proceeds. So if I were to just focus on this, you see this actually projection all the way on the surface of the, of the outer membrane. So one of the arguments that has been put forth and has dominated the field has to do with this electrostatic argument based on the fact that most of the antimicrobial peptide have an overall positively charged. And what distinguished between plant and mammalian cell membrane versus that of bacterial and microbe-membrane surfaces is that the outer leaflet of the membrane by a mammalian membrane is usually overall neutral, whereas the one of the bacterial surface has an overall negative charge. So by electrostatic argument, that there would be a stronger partitioning of the peptide to the microbial surface as opposed to the whole surface. Therefore, at the same dose, it would kill the microbe and leave the host harmless. So based on this argument, there has been several models that has been suggested in terms of the mechanism of disruption of these antimicrobial peptide. If I were to start off the peptide, which is being, secluded, uh, being secreted by our body as a response to a um, stimulus uh, locally, the peptide in solution would be at low concentration with the first surface associated with the membrane. And one model of their disruption is that they actually bore pores through the membrane by these barrel state models, sort of like what you have in a beer, uh, uh, barrel that you would have hydrophobic part lining with the hydrophobic tail and the red part, which is the hydrophobic part, providing a, a channel so as to make the membrane use its um, potential uh, uh, barrier function. So another thing is that, well, maybe it acts more like a detergent, sort of like it would populate on the surface and then associate with them call this carpet model and lead to mycelization, eventually dissolve this, giving to cell death, or it might form a larger pore. In this case, it actually changed the orientation of the lipid by changing the local spontaneous curvature, also giving rise to a pore formation, but this pore involving lipids also is quite different from this pore size. So the question is that even though there has been all these models and the model is put forth due to um, NMR uh, uh, data and also some X-ray data, there has not been any direct visualization 
of the disruptive process. So the question that we want to ask is that, can we really visualize the morphological change and from such visualization, allow us to determine what is the mechanism of the disruption? So I will show you direct visualization using atomic force microscopy technique to allow us to actually follow, as a function of time, how the antimicrobial peptide interact with the lipid. The other question is that, well, it has been very as well established that electrostatic interaction plays a role in the selectivity. But is this the only thing that matters? Are there other factors which are maybe as important, if not more important, than the electrostatic effect that give rise to the potency of the antimicrobial peptide actions? So I would argue, and I will show you data that support the fact that the fluidity of the membrane as well as the hydrophobic mismatch, so how thick the layer is compared to how thick the peptide is um, in terms of the hydrophobic part, plays an important role in this selectivity. So what we're gonna show you are all model systems, either in support of bilayer, which is shown here on a microsurface. So um, we have, are looking at a mammalian mimic of the membrane using a spinarionic apolar head group or using a negatively charged half group to mimic the bacterial surface. And what we do is that we spread it on the microsurface under physiological conditions and monitor the effect of antimicrobial peptide. So we were not the first one to think of using atomic force microscopy, which allow us to get topographic information of the system to really try to get at this very small length scale pore formation in the system. Other people before us have actually attempted to do this, but all they can report is that before and after the introduction of the antimicrobial peptide, you only see an increase of roughness of the system. So what they're using here is a continuous bilayer. So you have a bilayer that cover the whole surface, and they introduce antimicrobial peptide on the surface. But if you were to remember this picture, when we subject our E. coli to the um, antimicrobial peptide action, there's actually an expansion of the surface outer membrane. And so maybe having a complete contiguous layer on the surface is not the best way to mimic the environment that is found on the microbe surface. So instead, what we do is that these are AMM images of bilayer patches. So what you see here, the orange part is a bare microsurface, and the more golden part is actually a supported bilayer. And you can do a line scan across it. It is on the order of 4.3 nanometers in thickness. So we have a coexistence between a bare surface and these bilayer patches that is done by deposition. And what we do is that we interrogate the surface using atomic force microscopy. So to make the long story short, there is actually three characteristic structural transformation that can be observed in this type of system. When you have no antimicrobial peptide, the domain actually maintains a smooth round edge, so line tension is aligned as well, but if you add a small amount of antimicrobial peptide, the first instability that you see is an edge instability. And further addition gives rise to the pore formation and eventually, the whole self-assembled process is completely disrupted, and instead of having a binder, and now you have these worm like myself formation. So for uh, those of you who are in the soft matter area in the audience, this is very much similar to the formation or organization of, uh, of myself and the interactions of detergent and binder formation. So let's go through it one at a time. The first instability, as I said, is the edge instability. So starting off from a smooth edge, you actually now have a rugged edge, and this rugged edge remains rugged. The fact that you go from a smooth edge to a rugged edge means that your line tension is being diminished as a function of the association of the peptide. Even though we cannot see where they are located, I would argue that at least they are partially located at the edge. To juxtapose this with the case when you do not have the action of antimicrobial peptide, you see that now you have bilayer patches that are actually under lateral motion. They find each other, they actually merge and coalesce, but the line tension is light and well, so over time they actually go from an extended shape to a smooth shape. So the fact that we have this shape, which is stable over time, tells us that the line tension is compromised. The second thing that you see that it, it is indeed the line tension and compromise is that you can actually carry out molecular dynamic simulation 
to see if I have a ribbon model and to see how the line tension is being modulated as a function of the number of peptides you add to the system. So you see here are the numbers that the line tension dropped from 37 piconewton to 18 piconewton when you have four um, antimicrobial peptide that is aligning the edge of this ribbon of the binder that is here. So this is a continuous boundary condition that is used in the simulation process. So in a way, the fact that it's a line active, it acts very much similar like a 1D detergent, as you would imagine, that you can use a 1D Gibbs absorption isotherm to describe the behavior of the surface. So starting from the binder, this peptide is line active, so we go to the edge, and as it does so, very much like adding a detergent, it goes through a phase whereby it reduces the line tension. And as it's populating the line enough, edge enough, then it would have to start populating the lamella portion, leading to a plateau region of the line tension. There's no further drop, but once it's saturated this plateau region, it has to go further to the edge and then lead to a second state, and eventually it would give rise to the destabilization and micellization of the process. If I were to look at it as a function of the concentration of the antimicrobial peptide, you would see that a intact binary surface started having dimples or defects in the surface. The defect grows and more holes, and eventually these holes become the, the surface. So to continue with the analogy, you can see that if I were to just looking at a detergent, which is in coexistence with a phospholipid, as I increase this detergent to phospholipid ratio, you see the effect of first forming holes, then forming these worm-like micelle, and eventually forming the micellar formation, in a way very similar to the type of observation that we see of forming a hole and eventually forming this worm-like micelle and eventually the micelle formation in the system. In the case when you were to look at the second stage, which is the pore formation, and when we now move on from a spinorionic lipid to an anionic lipid, which is to represent a bacteria, what we would expect at the beginning is that you would use a lower dose and it would have a very similar type of structural transformation. So it was very surprising when we actually observed the result that the type of structural transformation in the case of an anionic lipid under the same, otherwise same experimental conditions are actually quite dissimilar. In fact, if you were to zoom in into one of these and try to look at them, you see that they're low pore formation. It basically looks like there are these worms that are growing from the edge, penetrating into the center without forming any holes. On top of that, the concentrations that we need are also much higher in these particular cases. So that back the questions that why does a system which we think would be selectively targeted by the antimicrobial peptide actually is impenetrable for the antimicrobial peptide. So in order to understand and look at what's happening in this system, the only thing we can think of that is different between the two is that this, in this particular case, it might be in a more solid, a more gel-like phase, making it harder to penetrate. So what I mean by gel phase is that when you have the lipid, when they're ordering, in their fluid phase, the tails are tilted. And in a gel phase, the tail are more upright. And so if it is true, then the effective thickness of the binder should be higher. And indeed, that is the case. When we were to do a line scan, which is shown here, we see that this is the bare mica surface, and this is the binder. And this particular system, even though it has the same number of hydrocarbon tail, is actually on the order of nine angstrom thicker than the other case, suggesting that it, it is indeed that it's in a different phase state. And by having a different phase state, it makes a big difference in terms of the capability of the antimicrobial peptide to penetrate into the system. So just to ensure this is true, now we look at a mixed system. Mixing in 20% of the anionic lipid with 80% of the polar lipid that is in the system. And indeed, when we just look at this mixed system, we see that the binary patches actually have two heights. And these two heights, again, are separated by nine angstrom in thickness, in the sense that the lower part, which is the more tilted part, is the more fluid phase, and the one that is higher, 
we surmise that must be the gel phase. So how would a patch like this, when subjected to the action of the antimicrobial peptide, would behave? And when we were to look at that, what we see is that it is only the part that is darker would actually form holes when you subject the system to the antimicrobial peptide action. Now, if I were to modulate the fluidity of the system, it seems that the gel phase is more impenetrable compared to the liquid phase. So if I were to modulate the fluidity of the system, making the system more and more fluid by choosing a particular lipid that would have a gel liquid phase transition far away from the um, experimental temperature, then we should expect there is a differentiation between the different fluidity and the action of the antimicrobial peptide. So what we choose is that two lipid whose gel transition temperature is below the experimental temperature. So in both of these cases, during experimental temperature, they would be in the fluid phase, but one is more fluid than the other, we would look at their behavior and see if this fluidity argument makes sense. Because after all, in the case of the evolution of the microbes to dodge the effect of the antimicrobial peptide, it seems that changing the acyl chain is one of the action. Whoops, it's too fast. Sorry. So what you see here indeed, the one that is more fluid actually becomes much more disrupted under the same dosage compared to the one that is closer in the transition temperature to the experimental temperature. If I were now to move it to a higher temperature, to two systems who will both be in the gel phase, it's just that one is closer to the temperature of experiment and one is further away from the temperature experiment, I would expect the longer chain one to be less penetrable because now it is even further away in the gel phase than the one that has a relatively shorter chain length. And indeed, in all of these systems, none of them you will see any penetration. So this number zero is trying to enumerate the number of aberration in terms of pore formation in the system. And you see that in none of these systems, even though they're under very high dosage, none of the system, there are holes that are being bored into the system. So what if I were to start with a system that were in the, initially above the transition temperature, and then I increase the temperature of my experiment so that it would go from the gel phase to the fluid phase. And if I do that, you would actually see that when I started off with something that is below the transition temperature, the action of the antimicrobial peptide cannot penetrate from a binder, but however, it can very much like a muck cracking, it can provide crack and penetrate from the edge into the interior of the system. However, if now I raise the temperature to above the transition temperature, instantaneously, these form the worm like mice formation that is due to the um, association of the antimicrobial peptide with the lipid themselves. So how does fluidity actually affect the activity of PG1? We know that the fluidity by itself does not affect the surface absorption because that's the job of the charge of the lipid and the charge of the peptide. However, the fluidity actually prevents, or the lack of the fluidity, prevents the efficient insertion of the antimicrobial peptide into the lipid system. It also prevents the lateral diffusion, making it harder for them to form the pore formation. In fact, one of the strategies of the antimicrobial peptide to really change the behavior and to inhibit the disruption of the antimicrobial peptide is really to add steroid into the system to inhibit the disruption, for example, by a, uh, like things like melatonin. So if that is the case, let's examine what is the effect of the chain link on the system. So, so far I've shown you data taking at 30 degrees Celsius and of materials that are saturated in chain link, so the transition temperature hover around this temperature. They are close to the system, but they are all fluid, even if they're fluid, the chain link cannot be differentiated from the effect of the fluidity. However, if I change the all monounsaturated lipid, the chain link are different, but they're so far away from my experimental temperatures that to first order, they are all fluid in a very similar sense, and we want to see if there is any correlation between this and their antimicrobial activity. So indeed, if I were to look at a 14, 16, and 18 chain carbon 
with a single double bond in a spinorionic or polar head group lipid system, I see that there is a difference in terms of the ability of the antimicrobial peptide to penetrate. The longer chain length giving rise to a longer hydrophobic core, and this is an increasing thickness of the hydrophobic core of the lipid itself, you see that the shorter they are, the easier it is for the peptide to penetrate and give rise to the disruption that is seen in this picture that is here. If I were to put it in a computer model for the hydrophobic portion of the peptide versus the mismatch or the matching of the hydrophobic portion of the lipid, you see can understand that why the shorter, shorter um, phospholipid is more susceptible because it matched nicely with the hydrophobic pocket of the antimicrobial peptide. And this has been also um, corroborated by other experiments. So, so far I have shown you a two-dimensional system whereby you have a supported bilayer and we're looking at pore formation into this system. You can also make a more better mimic of the cell by moving to a three-dimensional system. So what you see here is a giant neural vesicle. So these are single lamella separating what is inside, so we just put dye solution in the inside. Actually, the surface of the membrane is also has dye in red color, but it's just got overshadowed by this, and this is tatted on the surface. So these are single molecule, whereby a molecule is on the order of 30 to 50 micron in diameter. And what you see when I subject this to the action of antimicrobial peptide, you can look at how the intensity of the inside got plummeted because now holes are being bored on the surface so that materials are leaking out from the inside to the outside. And in fact, as that happens, now you can start at the very end, you can start just seeing the fluorescence from the labeling that is on the lipid itself. So, so for the last bit, I want to show you that there is actually some universality that is associated with the mechanism of action uh, across the class of the antimicrobial peptides. So I said that there are over 1,200 antimicrobial peptides that have been identified, and they could be in the different primary and secondary structures. And it has been a conundrum as to how to really classify the action of these peptides. And we want to see things that are, you know, might have a different structures and have been classified as a different mechanism, where they could show a similar type of action. So this is just a summary of some of the antimicrobial peptides we have examined. Not all of them exhibit the similar type of line instability, pore formation, and disintegration by forming myself. But if you were to look closely at at least these three, they form very similar type of rugged edge pore formation. And so just to blow one of them up and to license it from cows, you can actually see the pore formation and instability, and eventually they break up into the micelle formation. So to conclude, I hope I've convinced you that the selectivity of the antimicrobial peptide is indeed controlled by the uh, lipid composition. It is true that the charge effect plays an important role, but it is by no means the only governing role in terms of the activity of the antimicrobial peptide on the, on the microbes. In fact, the membrane order, as well as the acyl chain length, actually affects the activity of PG1 in terms of the formation of stable pores, and these stable pore formation in return lead to the leakage of the intracellular, intracellular materials as shown in the model example by the giant moon vesicle. In, in terms of going back to evolution, bacteria can actually alter their membrane fluidity by either adding acyl chain or changing the hydrophobic pocket into that chain, I won't get all into the detail of it, in order to dodge the effect of the antimicrobial peptides. And this, in turn, would lead to this feedback loop of having bacterial resistance of the two what's our innate immune system and how our innate immune system would, in response, also mutate to be more potent towards this new strand of bacteria and microbe. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention.